welcome to Straight Talk with Carly Lissa Thorne. And I am really excited today because today I have the beautiful and wonderful Danian and Catherine Brinkley with me. And I love them both equally because they both have this beautiful energy that is very open, embracing, and they have a lot of knowledge to share. So welcome, Danian and Catherine. Thank you, Carly. Thank you for having us on with you today. Thank you. I am so delighted to have you both. So I like to just start with a couple things. And so I'm going to start with Dan. Dan, because you're on the left-hand side, so it's just natural for me to go there. I'd love for you just to share with everybody, what was your inspiration? I mean, we're going to get into a little bit about near-death experiences and what people call NEDs. But I'd like to go a little bit further back and just sharing with people, what was your inspiration on whether you're shifting in your life, becoming spiritually open in your life? What was your inspiration, do you think? Well, I grew up in the South. Uh, Carly, where, you know, everybody goes to hell in the South. And basically their religious beliefs create such a psychology. And I grew up as a tough guy. You know, I played sports, Marine Corps, worked for various government agencies. And I really didn't have much of a spiritual belief in anything uh, or a religious belief even less. And then one Friday, I mean, one Wednesday afternoon in September the 17th, I was struck by lightning. And in the course of that, I was dead for 28 minutes, completely paralyzed for six days, partially paralyzed for seven months, took two years to learn to walk and feed myself. But on top of that, Carly, I discovered that we are great, powerful, mighty spiritual beings, and we have a divine job, character, and nature to ourselves. And I spent that 28 minutes exploring what we now call heaven religiously, but dimensional reality qualitatively, but reality as it truly is on all three of those fronts. So we'll get a little bit more into that. I want these people to get an essence of Catherine. So Catherine, what was your inspiration in, into getting involved in spirituality or in how you got in touch with it? Uh, for me, Carly, it's a little bit different, although I have had two near-death experiences, but I was born interested in spirituality. I could see dead people when I was little. I could feel energy. I, I was followed around by guardians that I was aware of. I had conversations with gnomes. And I know this all sounds crazy, but it was my childhood. So naturally, as I, as I grew up, I was interested in the I Ching, the Tarot, palmistry, astrology, things like that. So it's just something that I believe I came in with. And then after our famous interview, I interviewed Daniel after uh, Saved by the Light came out in 1994. Um, I got even more interested in what he was doing and my spiritual base just kind of broadened from there. So you gave me a perfect segue because one of the things I'd love for people to get to know is how did the two of you become one yet two, you know, I, I love it. We all, when we get involved in relationships, a lot of people are like, oh, I need still need my independence. And I'm like, well, you've become two, but you're still one and you're still two. So um, I'd love for people just to get to know how the two of you became to be a partnership. Well, from my, my point, it was this, Carly. In those days when uh, Saved by the Light first came out, I never, ever thought that this book would become a legend and it would become a worldwide international bestseller with millions and millions and millions of people reading it. And I was probably doing five radio shows a day or five newspaper shows, but it was usually about five a day. In the first 30 seconds, I knew where the person was going because near death was, you know, woo woo and all of that. And I could figure them out. And then one afternoon, Catherine called and it was probably the third, maybe the fourth of the day. And, you know, here we go again. And she asked in-depth questions. And it was questions that really moved me to think, not about answering the same old stupid questions, the tunnel and do you believe and not believe, but for me to really look deeply inside of myself at this experience and to, to really take a good look at all of its meaning. It wasn't just about selling books. It was about what it had brought to life in me. And I could tell that she just didn't read the cheat sheet. She had read the book. She had read the book. And then in the early 90s, before I became famous, Daniel, I did a show in uh, Dallas. Dallas, Texas, 
which I always call Damien Does Dallas. And it was me when I didn't have to be so prim and proper. I didn't have to be the ultimate dead guy. I could just be Damien. And she had seen this. And I think I fell in love with her voice and her her deep spiritual knowledge and her ability to ask questions that not only were interesting to the reader, but moved your soul. You know, it was really interesting about what Daniel just said about Daniel Does Dallas. It was a videotape that he did, I think, in 92? 91. 91. Well, someone had sent it, a dear friend of mine had sent it to me in 1992 or 1993. And she said, Catherine, I just saw this video of this guy talking about his near-death experience, and I can't explain it to you, but every time I watch it, I think of you. You need to know this guy. So she sent it to me, and I... I didn't feel a connection necessarily to Daniel when I watched it, but I made everybody I knew sit down and watch it. And then about six months later, I was working for a metaphysical newspaper, and the Whole Life Expo was coming to Las Vegas. And so my editor said, um, is that in the way? My editor said that uh, I could interview anybody I wanted that was coming to the Expo. And she read down a list of names. You know, Deepak was there and Wayne Dyer and Marianne and Daniel Brinkley. And I said, oh, oh, my God, Daniel Brinkley, I have to interview him. And I'll never forget her response because she said, Catherine, what the hell is a Daniel Brinkley? And I said, you haven't seen the tape. You have to see it. And so I, I made plans to interview him. I got the galley from his publisher. And as I read through the pages... I knew, I knew this person. I knew his soul. I knew his essence. So the day we interviewed, I think we both knew that, you know, it was a reunion. I love that story. And I'm so glad you shared that because I, I know the people in the metaphysical community or people that you're close to know the story. And I'm glad we get to share that with so many other people that don't know who Daniel and Catherine Brinkley are. So um, thank you so much for sharing that. And Carly, in the next, when the next book came, she called me to interview me, and then she proposed marriage, and I accepted. <laughs> so it was love at first word, and then it was another year. Before we ever met each other. Before we ever met each other. But I, you know, you know, you hear all those stories about what when people fall in love, and, uh, you know, when you watch a lot of Cary Grant movies, but... When I saw her for the first time, I'm super cool. I'm a New York Times bestselling author. I'm the ultimate dead guy. My knees shook and my heart went in my throat. And there was this creature, this most glorious creature with a rose in her hand coming down the escalator. And that was the end of it. It's true. I saw him and this tidal wave of love surrounded me. And I knew I was home. And I told my girlfriend that day, I, I met myself today in a gray suit. He thinks it was green, but it was gray. He was wearing gray. And then she said, I never want to see him again. <laughs> and I think she said, the son of a bitch. Okay, but, you know, too bad. Too bad. I knew that this was that, this was, whether I was ready or not, yeah. this is where I'm supposed to be. And now, 20 years 20 later. 20 years later. I now know for sure this is where I'm supposed to be. Do you know what it's like uh, to um, live in the live at the circus, <laughs> and that you get up every morning waiting to see what she's going to come up to come up with to do next, and then the herd rolls in. You know, it's all the circus animals, the elephants, the lions, the tigers, and all the moods they're in. It's pretty. It's a pretty exciting life, but I wouldn't change a day of it. And what's funny is I went from super cool bachelor all my life to a uh, big-time guy, movies, all that stuff, to you're not my daddy, I need $20, <laughs> and it's your turn to take out the trash. He's talking about my six children I was going to get to that. One of the things I really wanted to ask you, Catherine, because I've had the privilege and honor. I just was uh, absolutely beautiful time with you guys recently and meeting some of the children and 
the plethora of beautiful animals and sisters and moms and everything. How has your metaphysical or spiritual essence of who you are, and Danielle, I'm going to ask you that question too because now you're part of that whole pod and family. The way you are, Catherine, how has that affected or inspired, motivated your children in being open to spirit or God or whatever it is that they believe? Well, they were born into a spiritual home. They really didn't have a choice. You know, this is what they were raised to believe. Um, the other night we had a new moon and the girls were out setting up a little altar and we did a little ceremony for the new moon and, and, and gave to the mother our new wishes for the next 28 days. This is just a part of their life. Dan, and we do it, we do it all, every, all the time. You know, saying blessings before we eat and, and getting up in the morning and having coffee together and pulling a, a card for the day. You know, you and I did that. So this is just the way they've been raised. And thank goodness they have all carried on these traditions because they're all grown up now. The baby's 21. 22. She'll be 22. Yeah. And um, they're all out of the house. But in their homes, you will see all the things that they grew up with. And, and another thing, too, Carly, as you watch the world change, this is what brings Kat and I into focus and where we're going with our lives. We watch the millennials. We watch those kids in, in our, which is our crowd in that age group. The world is scary. It is. It's unsafe. There's no opportunity like we had. And they struggle. But they can come to this house and they can sit down and they can feel safe. Mm -hmm. Because there is nothing that's ever changed in the patterns of full moons, of rituals, of every meal is going to be blessed Everybody's going to have a reason to be thankful. People are going to pull a card out of the 7,320 decks we have. <laughs> okay. And people are going to spend that time sharing those spiritual moments, which I realize in a world that is seriously frightening is a great sense of security and the rituals and traditions that Kat and I do not hesitate, do not fail do not move or alter wherever we are, that we do not follow full moons, new moons, what we bless, how we appreciate. And um, you can watch it from all the stress they're going through. When they come and they sit down, they know that that world is safe and it's consistently spiritually based. And as we work in our office and we do what we do, our life is about furthering the information First, to lose the fear of death, but to empower life so that they can celebrate life on both sides, both here and the hereafter. So there's something that I want to say, because I've been in the speaker industry and working with authors and speakers all around the world for a very long time. And I'm 50, and I, so I've experienced a bit, and I grew up overseas. So anyways, what I absolutely have to tell the audience is, you know, since I have worked with speakers, and like I was saying, the reason why I'm bringing this up is for a very pivotal reason. So many times I'll see a speaker go on stage and my job may be to carry them all the way through to the stage, make sure everything's set up, whatever it is. And on stage, they're, they're teaching a specific piece. And when they get off stage, they're a completely different person. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that time and time again. I was at this one course that I was co-writing and the person went up on stage and says, do not drink while you're eating because when your digestive enzymes are in your mouth. And so the minute you start drinking, you dilute that digestive, digestive enzymes and therefore you won't digest properly. Now, mind you, people paid over two to $3,000 for this course and we're all eating together, by the way, because it was, a, it was a special mastermind. And there was all these round tables all around. And what do you think the speaker does when he sits down, right? So what I want to share with the audience is I'm very picky about who, and a lot of people know this about me, about who I choose to spend my time with, who I choose to work with, who I choose to just surround myself with. And I have to say, I have experienced exactly what they're talking about. I got to spend a couple of days and I saw exactly what they're talking about. I saw their kids come into their home. I saw their kids just unload and breathe and ease. So every, in other words, what Daniel and Catherine are saying isn't something that they say on stage or put in a book and then go home and, and be completely different people. What they're saying, they live. They breathe and walk their talk. And to me, that is the most powerful message, teaching, you know, whatever it is that you feel connected to, that is what we all need to strive to, to attain to, is to live and talk our walk. Because 
that is such a powerful, powerful thing. So I really just want to let you know, I really admire you and appreciate you and love you guys for doing this because I, I saw the love coming from your kids and I know what I felt when I was there. So, I mean, seriously, you guys have done an amazing job. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so me. much. Because look, I, I call it the Swami business because I'm the furthest thing from woo-woo, you know, and I, I pay attention to woo-woo speakers. I mean, I watch them and first they talk to you. Then they talk at you. And then it's as though they're talking in a mirror to themselves. And it's the same stuff. But because I've been, you know, I've been at this 34 or five years, tours all over the world. So every major name I know, every person like you, I know them personally. And I get a chance to see exactly what you're describing. I appreciate, Carly, people who are trying to impact people so I don't talk about them behind their back or anything. But I see it. I see you're one person to the world and you're another person once you the curtain goes down. Well, I don't think that works. I think if you don't live your truth, sooner or later, that part will catch up to you. I only hope that this period of time, which I think is a serious transitional period of time, that more people, for whatever reason, find their spiritual connection and begin to believe and support that identity within themselves. It's not going to be money or goals or gold. It's not going to be riches or rewards. It's going to be an inner identity of the great, powerful, and mighty spiritual nature that you possess. I teach this all the time. You, the greatest thing that I learned when I was dead and been through three of these experiences is this. I know who you are. I have seen us. You cannot fool me about whether you are a great, powerful, and mighty spiritual being. And the other thing is that they taught me that to come here, especially in this particular time, are heroes. It takes a hero with success under their belt and accomplishment and achieving such great spiritual goals to ever be able to enter this earth dimensional plane. And the moment you accept that about yourself instead of born in sin and all that garbage you listen to, you begin to see the world differently. And Kat and I try so much to hold that light and hold that truth in our everyday life when it's just us, which is never. Our- <laughs> no, it's not. It's cats, it's dogs, it's children, it's visitors, it's press. It's 500 phone calls. Oh, my God. It's true. But whenever we get that 30 minutes, we don't change. I mean, we stay close to that spiritual. We look at, we pull cards, we ask each other, we talk, and we stay close. This is going to be the salvation for the planet. And now that the Pope has come become interested in the in the legendary environmental uh, concept, I had a vision in 1975 when I was, quote unquote, dead for that 28 minutes, that said there would come into being something called an environmental religion. Well, if you're a fundamentalist living in South Carolina, that's the stupidest stuff an angel could tell you. But this is uh, who told me this being a lie. And today, here we are 40 years later, the Pope, are because to have an environmental religion would would mean that we were returning to paganism because that's how it was seen. The Pope in his 191-page report released yesterday, an encyclical, the second most powerful voice from the church, he calls the earth her, she, Mother Nature. Gaia. I mean, and this is a, this is the thing that I love about what you're saying, and other things that I've read, and I, you know, things we've talked about, reading your books, etc. Is that a lot of things you're talking about isn't something that isn't stuff we already kind of know or has been talked about. Is that we need to see proof. We need to see that A plus B equals C. We choose not to believe unless we can see something tangible in our hands. And if you go back in time and you look at all these things and the, the beautiful pictures of Gaia in Mother Earth and all these things, it's not something that's not hasn't been known. It's just the awareness and choosing to actually, like you, like you both have done, 
tapping into our intuition and our knowing and being open to actually allowing and, and doing from that place instead of having to have all this tangible proof. But I wrote this in a book 21 years ago. This event happened to me. This event happened to me 40 years ago. But 21 years ago, in Chapter 5 in Saved by the Light, I wrote these prophecies because I didn't know they were prophecies, Carly. All I knew was this is what I was shown would be our probable future if we chose not to change from the mindset that we're operating from. So for people who who worry about if there's a life after death or if there's a near-death experience, I am the least likely person to ever believe that because I would have never believed it if it didn't happen to me. But now, 40 years later, the Pope is reaching out to the whole world. He put out his encyclical. That's out. He is going to come to the United States and speak before the United Nations. Then he's coming to speak before the Congress. And then he's going to Paris in December for the next, what they call the Kyoto Treaties. So we are watch an environmental religion come back into play. I don't want to give away everything it says in Saved by the Light, but if you can look at three or four things that were said, and I wrote these down in 1976, and they are happening now. We're all at a juncture in our lives, and what Kat and I are trying to do is to drive the spiritual identity, what appears to be the most elusive part of our reality. Paying bills are are elusive or part of a lot of people's reality. But that part that's the most elusive is going to be the strongest. And this is our cause. You know, open up your eyes, everybody. Feel what your heart guides you to be. Look at the resources that you have. If it's just pulling a card that changes your intention, that changes the reason why you got up today, and that you focus on that and achieve that as opposed to the drudgery and and the crap that you go through as you face each day, look for the joy in it. Always look for the joy. And the one thing I love about Catherine, I myself have like 20 decks. And on my desk, I have like, you know, um, Jerry and Her- Esther Hicks. I have Louise. H- I have all these affirmations in front of me. The first thing I do in the morning is I'm reading, you know, I love life. I love life. I'm glad to be alive, right? I'm reading all these beautiful things, and this is what I surround myself with. This is what I choose to wake up to. So, I, I mean, I, I, I'm so, I just, I, I love your spirits. So I do want to, I, you know, you guys and I could talk forever and ever, and we don't want to do that to the audience, but I do want to address a couple of things that are important. So, Catherine, um, I know you guys have some new things coming out, and I know you have a brand-new website that you've been working on, and you have a membership that you're working on. So I, I'd like to touch a little bit upon that. And then, Dan, I definitely want to talk about the cruise that people can come on and join and learn from the two of you, which is a beautiful cruise with beautiful destinations that you can talk about. So, Catherine, why don't you share, and since this is, remember, this is a podcast, not just a website, can you also spell out the website, not just say it? Okay. Yes, we're putting up a brand new website, danianandcatherine.com. Really? I, I, I don't think he's got it set up that way yet, but D-A-N-N-I-O-N-A-N-D-K-A-T-H-R-Y-N-B-R-I-N-K-L-E-Y.com, Danian and Catherine.com. And, and we're, Google them anywhere, and you can put in Danian Brinkley and Catherine Brinkley. Right. You can find them all over, Facebook, Twitter, so don't be afraid to also just Google if something sounds too long or... Or just, Danian, or just put in Danian, that would that will probably take you there too. Um, but we're very excited about it. It's a beautiful site, and we're offering something that we've been talking about for a long, long time to invite people to join our spiritual community. We've developed the Brinkley Perspective, which is a monthly membership. And for eleven dollars a month, because three cents a day. Three cents a day. <laughs> Um, I'm a numerologist, so 11 is my birthday. I thought 11 was a, was a perfect amount. Um, they will receive from us five different, um, what do you say, goodies, five different items every month. First of all, there will be a guided meditation by uh, Daniel and myself. There will be affirmations, weekly affirmations from me. Daniel will be doing his infamous, that ain't nothing, 
which is his own personalized rant on what's going on in the world and what people can do about it, how it affects them personally. That's a video. And then we're going to be doing a podcast with people that we admire, cutting edge authors and teachers, you know, who are going to come on and tell us what they think is happening in the world. And then um, we're going to put together a list of our favorite things, like our favorite books or movies or products or services. Mm -hmm. So you might as well get ready, Carly, to be interviewed in our podcast. That's right. Why? Thank you. <laughs> I'd love for you to, I'm really excited about this cruise. I've already started sharing it out and it just, it's just going to be very impactful. It's going to be very waking for people. So I'd love for you to share with people what is the cruise, when is it, and what is going to happen on this cruise and the destination, because that's the important part. I don't want to give away. I want you to tell them. Yeah, but the whole point of it is this. Even before I was dead, I was a Maya fan. It's a Mesoamerican tribe that is probably the most advanced uh, astronomical group their numerical system called the Mayan calendar. I discovered them in 1968, and I was so amazed. I went to the 68 Olympics in Mexico, and in between uh, boxing and field and track and field was water polo and girls dancing and figure skating, which didn't interest me very much. And someone said, let's go look at the pyramids. Well, I laughed, then I mocked them. And we got in the car and we drove two hours and at three o'clock in the morning, we pulled out into a field. We found this flat rock. We laid out on this flat rock. And when I woke up, I was at Teotihuacan, this beautiful, magnificent place that was utterly breathtaking. And I realized that 18 years old, everything that I'd ever been taught about history was a lie. And then I began to observe and I spent the next three months exploring Mesoamerica, especially the Maya culture. The Mayans and the culture is so important to us at this particular time because their calendar is describing a shift and change so accurate, Carly, that it's scary, that we are, met, we are changing, that a new era has begun, another 394-year period, which is called a Baktun, is occurring. So when I saw this boat cruise, it gives us a chance to leave Miami, to sail around the Caribbean, to be quiet little places, to stop, to enjoy ourselves, and to be with community, people who are searching for a moment to catch their breath, for a moment to quietly interact with us. Sean David and Morton and Catherine and I and a group of people, Susan. Susan Shumsky. Yeah, to sit down and not just listen to the lecture and go about your business, but to live among us and to be among us and have quiet conversations and to stop and enjoy the beauty of the Caribbean, but most important, to stop at Rotan, which is a beautiful island off the coast of Belize, where, you know, you get a chance to cleanse your soul. And we, you know, we're so ceremonial crazy. We'll have about 15 billion different ceremonies, but that, that you're safe, you're protected, you're at sea. You, you can breathe. The food is great. The, the boat is great. The time is great. But to get to Atunha, there is three levels of Maya. There's pre-classic, classic, and post-classic. I'm not very interested in classic or post-classic. I'm very interested in pre-classic. The oldest temple of the sun in the Americas is Atunha. When you walk upon that land, you look at the building, you look at its structure, you look at how the Lancet arches who came into place that happened a thousand years or 2,000 years or 3,000 years before anyone discovered the structural strength of a Lancet arch in Western world. And you get a chance to sit at a place that's 4,000 years old. And here's what's interesting. Think about this. Maya. We discovered Neptune in 1844. The Mayas discovered Neptune in 21, no, 24, 21 BCE. We discovered Pluto in 1932. They discovered Pluto in 24, 21 BCE. When you start to think about this, 
and to realize that they could calculate the cycles of the earth in such precision. Why not at this particular time, at this particular point in history, and in that shift, go and touch the oldest ceremonial place of the sun and to, to come and to be together, to have comprehensive thoughts, to make new commitments, to make new friends, and to be among us like a family. I get so excited, Carly, because I have loved the, them for over 45 years. And I'm, I won't say that I'm an expert, but I'm an expert in, in Maya culture, tradition, and the calendars and what these cycles mean. And, and there'd be a chance in a moment that when we get on the boat and we get settled in, I'll give people a guide of what the calendar says about today and about each day. And usually Kat creates a small chart based on the Maya viewpoint and the cycles of who each person is so that they can live as Maya. From the time you get on that boat to the time you get off that boat, your mind will be in a Mayan culture and you get a chance to infuse yourself into history and its capability and you will prove unequivocally that there was some something happened that created where this bunch of little tiny people became so so uh, immensely brilliant in calculating cycles and spheres. The Mayas believe, Carly, that five complete different cycles are occurring each day in your life. To become aware of those cycles gives you insight into how do you deal with your relationships, how do you deal with children, work, how you deal with love, but most important, how you design your life to catch the role that that cycle is happening. And after 45 years, it, I can't wait. So I want to share with people a little bit about it. It's called, it's by New Life, and it's the Mayan Cruise to Enlightenment. And it's seminar at sea, 2015, and sailing through Consumel, Mexico, which I've spent quite a bit of time since I spent, grew up in South America. I lived in Mexico, Venezuela, and Brazil. So I've explored some of these places, so I'm really excited to revisit. Then we go to Ilz Rotan, Honduras, and they have Belize City in Belize, Costa Maya, Mexico, and it originates in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And this is from October 29th through November 5th, eight glorious days. And if you want to know more, you can go to www.newlifecruise.com. And you can find out more. And, of course, Daniel and Catherine will be posting that all over. And we are running short on time, so I, I will be remiss if I didn't mention a couple other little things. So both of us, me and both of you, I mean, um, just recently did a movie, The Secrets of the Keys. And I love, you know, there's so many self-development movies out there, and we could have done so many other ones. I'd love to know from you, Catherine. You're one of the main characters in it. What was your inspiration behind doing this particular movie versus all the other self-development movies that are out there? Well, you know, the universe brings us things in the most miraculous ways. And I met the, the writer and producer of the film, Robin Jay, who had lived down the street from me for 20 years, was very much into the spiritual arena in Las Vegas, but our paths had never crossed until I was invited to a premiere of her first movie, The Keeper of the Keys. I wasn't able to attend this premiere, but I asked my daughter, Elizabeth, to go because I just felt there was something important about it. And after she saw the movie and came home, she told me, oh, my God, Mom, you have to meet Robin. She's going to be one of your best friends, and she's from Cleveland, Ohio, and she graduated high school the same year you did. And I'm like, oh, this is just unbelievable. Thank God funny. I mean, it was we lived like one suburb apart and again, never met all the time we were in Cleveland. So we had lunch together. There was an instant rapport. And she was telling me she was thinking about making another movie. I watched the first one and loved it. And so me I too. Yeah. And I encouraged her to make it. And I said, we'll help you in any way that we can. So one thing led to another. And she came to me and said, would you like to play the part of Gwen? Uh, in the movie. And I thought, oh, okay. She says it's based, you know, kind of on the Wizard of Oz. And I'm thinking, 
okay, Glenda didn't do much. She came down in a big bubble, and that was it. And we went and saw that movie a hundred times. Yeah, but then she gives me 18 pages of dialogue. (laughs) I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is a real commitment. But I had the best time. So my inspiration to answer your question for making this movie is my love of Robin and I am devoted to supporting her and helping her to be successful in what she's trying to do because it's huge and it's needed. And she's an extraordinary soul. And Carly, let me add this to it. Like you said, we get about a hundred pitches a month. I mean, everybody in the world wants us to sign off on, be a part of, participate because the name brings certain credibility. But when I watch the film, I watched it twice, the first one, because the first time she made me do it, okay, which is how most things happen. The second time when I watched it, Carly, the way that she structured it, it takes the quote-unquote hell out of Mm self-help. You get involved in the story. You get involved in the characters like you would in any other movie. And you, you look at it like it's a real movie instead of a self-help deal. With talking heads. Yeah. And I looked at this, and the way she had structured it, when Kat came to me, because we talk all, 99% of everything, we talk it over, you know, so we get a good perspective. And, you know, I have like an eye for that kind of stuff. But when you, when you take a look at it, and I was reading the script, this is going to be a tremendous film. I hate to say it like this but it's going to be extremely empowering for women Mm -hmm. as they're making the decisions about their marriages, about their job, about who they are, re-identifying, and it's given steps. It's not a bunch of okay this and that. Here's an expert in this field. He's an expert in this field. You take this information, and when you're done, you're back in power. You have recaptured and taken back your power. And as I watched the filming, I was, I'm so very proud. I mean, I was just so very proud to participate in it and to watch Catherine be as magnificent as I know she is. I'm really excited because, like you said, it. what I loved about what you did was it's not like your typical self-development movie where it's just experts coming at you. And being that she created a storyline behind it, so, if you will, the experts are guides to help the people person go through their journey and get this good advice from people. So, it's not your typical self-help movie from that direction, which I absolutely love about it. I love the fact that there's really rich characters, and really there's just an actual backstory where you, you fall in love with the characters, you fall in love with the story. At the same time, you're getting really good, valuable advice from really amazing people. 